Born in 1892, the poet Hugh McDermott is now acclaimed as the greatest Scottish poet since Robert Burns. But McDermott is more than a poet. For most of this century, he has been trying to change the political destiny of Scotland through his poems, his writings, his attacks on his fellow countrymen, his hatred of all things English. Many of the contradictions of Scotland are reflected in the poet's life and politics. He berates Scotland for its provincialism, its romanticism, and its obsession with bogus history. Yet he stands accused himself of all these things. Hugh McDermott has also combined a fervent Scottish nationalism with a pitiless communism in an attempt to create a Scotland quite alien to England. Drums in the wall gate, pipes in the air. Come and hear the crying of the fair. Oh, as it used to be when I was a loon on common riding day in the muckle toon. The bearer twiddles the bannock and sorts herring. The croon of roses through the lift is fairing. The ock fit thistle wallops on high, and heather besoms o'er the hills gang by. Drums in the wall gate, pipes in the air. The wallop and thistle is ill to bear. Ours was a frontier spirit. For generations, we had confronted the English across the border. England, the old enemy, was just six miles away to the south of Langham, the small town on the Scottish borders where the poet now known as Hugh McDermott was born Christopher Murray Grieve in 1892. My father was a postman in Langham, and my mother was a God-fearing woman. to be at crowdy now when the last trumpet blows and see the deed come loupin' o'er the old grey wars. Muckle men we toozle beards I grat at as a bairn I'll scramble frae the crooded clay we feck a swearin and glower at God and o' his gang o' angels i' the left they trashy bleasin' French-like folk who guard them shift. My father's people were workers in the woolen mills of the Scottish borders. My mother's family were farm workers from the countryside around the town of Langham. They lie buried in Crowdy now. Fain the women folk'll seek to mock them hod the row. Fegs, God's no blate, Guinea stirs up the men of Crowdy now. underneath a library and I had a key. At night when it was closed I would creep up. Books on science, philosophy, religion, languages and the literatures of many countries. The poet's people were lowland Scots whose rural society was one of the first in the world to be literate. The young Christopher Grieve grew up with a reverence for knowledge which was later to mark the poetry of Hugh McDermott. The Scottish radical tradition was also still strong at the turn of the century. My uncles were gamekeepers at Langham Lodge where Edward VII stayed. There was a contempt for that whole aristocratic setup. The Boer War turned most Britons into patriots, but many radicals opposed the imperial ideal. I remember my family and many other Scottish working people being bitterly opposed to the Boer War. Some Scots identified the Boers' fight for a separate state with Scottish demands for home rule. In 1906, at the age of 15, I left Langham to continue my education in Edinburgh. Edinburgh had been the capital of Scotland when it was a nation, and there had been strong popular opposition to the idea of union with England. But in 1707, the Scottish Parliament ruling a country poor and almost bankrupt, decided to sign the Act of Union and join with England in what was to be called Great Britain. 200 years later, 
When the young McDermott came to Edinburgh, he found three pillars of the old nation still standing. As a child, I learned a lot in argument with the ministers of the Kirk in Langham. The Church of Scotland was founded in 1560 by John Knox, a hard and very political Protestant. Scottish Calvinism preached a democracy where no man stood between the believer and God. The followers of Knox took their zeal from John Calvin in Geneva and believed themselves the elect of a stern, demanding God. The grip of Calvinism in Scottish life was not to slacken for nearly 400 years. I have always fought the cold, hard oppression by the Kirk of freedom and imagination in Scotland. The second pillar of the old nation was Scottish law. It also owed more to Europe than to England. Indeed, its legal codes were closer to old Roman law than the system peculiar to England called common law. The educational system was the third, now crumbling pillar of old Scotland. Knox's church prescribed a school in every parish, and the elected elders of the Kirk then made sure every child attended. It was a harsh but effective system, for by 1750, Scotland was one of the first countries in the world where the common people of the countryside could read and write. The young McDermott was moulded by these old disciplines. Scotland did not specialise. It produced generalists, polymaths, adaptable graduates who could turn their minds or hands to almost anything. At the end of the last century, Scotland held an astonishingly powerful economic position for a country in the northern edge of Europe with a population of just four and a half million. The Clyde shipyards alone built more ships than all Germany, and Glasgow's engineering works were the world's principal suppliers of locomotives, bridges, and machine tools. The workers sucked in from the countryside, from the highlands and from Ireland, were packed into the tenements of Glasgow and Dundee. But in the years before the First World War, new social forces were at work, threatening the old order. McDermott, then in his teens, was already writing and agitating. His father, who wanted him to be a teacher, died suddenly when McDermott was 18. The sun lifts still on me, you rowed include. We look upon each other new like hills across the valley. I'm nae mere your son, it is my mind nae son of yours that looks. And the great darkness of your death comes up and engulfs it across the way. A living man upon a dead man thinks, and only small thoughts impossible. Scotland's history has been described as one long brawl. But some Scots believed that the Scottish regiments had been made the cutting edge of imperial expansion, and that the Highland soldiers in particular had become the Cossacks of the British Empire. Many socialists opposed the First World War, but McDermott, in the first of many paradoxes of his life, was one socialist who volunteered. He joined the Royal Army Medical Corps and served in Salonika, Italy and France. It was Clausewitz, I think, who said that the Scottish Highlanders were the only soldier in Europe who, without training, could unflinchingly face the bayonet. To many socialists, a bayonet in the Great War was simply a weapon with a worker at each end. McDermott's reaction to the war was also bitter, but peculiarly Scottish. Others will tell you that men of the Isles charged at Bannockburn to the skull of the pipes, that the sound of the pibroch rose loud and shrill where the fire was hottest at Waterloo. At Alma, its notes made the blood surge in the veins of the 42nd. At Dargai, the Peabrock sent the Gordon storming up the heights. And so the story goes on. And they will tell you how, when Scotland brought home the greatest of her heroes dead, the routineer Haig, whose lack of imagination carried him through, 
Bajaj Watlos. It was only when the piper came down the nave, pouring forth the lament which enshrines the heroes of Flodden and all the dead in all the Floddens of history. Only then did the eyes grow dim with tears. While fellow socialists denounced patriotism, the soldier poet came to another conclusion. Scots should in future fight for Scotland's freedom and not die defending other small nations. Was it for little Belgium's sake, say money thousand Scotsmen deed, and never aim for Scotland, fags, we twenty thousand times mere need. In Easter 1916, Irish nationalists rose in rebellion against the British. We declare the right of the people of Ireland to the ownership of Ireland and to the unfettered control of Irish destinies to be sovereign and indefeasible. Six times during the past 300 years they have asserted it in arms. We hereby proclaim the Irish Republic as a sovereign, independent state. And they proclaimed it in the name of God and of the dead generations, for three of the rebel leaders were also poets. If I had been in a position to desert the British Army and fight with the Irish nationalists, I would have done so. The leader of the Irish workers, Citizen Army, was a man brought up in Edinburgh of Irish parents, James Connolly. Even Connolly wrote poetry, but he was in fact a tough trade union organiser from Scotland, a socialist and a nationalist. Scots steel tempered with Irish fire is the weapon that I desire. Badly wounded during the fighting, Connolly was taken prisoner when the British army put down the rising. Twelve days later, he was found guilty of treason, tied to a chair and shot. But now in the flower and iron of the truth, to you we turn, and turn in vain, Neymar. Ilka fool has folly in yuch for sadness, but at last we are wise and we laughter tear the veil of being and are face to face with the human race. Where the Irish nationalists failed with the rebellion, the Russian Bolsheviks succeeded with the revolution. McDermott came to see in Lenin a will implacable enough to change the course of history. Lenin himself saw the same iron in a schoolmaster from Glasgow, called John MacLean, who was to become for the poet Scotland's revolutionary martyr. The Russian Bolsheviks appointed John MacLean their consul in Glasgow, and there were other high honours. The first Congress of Soviets in 1917 elected as honorary presidents Vladimir Lenin himself, Leon Trotsky, another formidable intellectual but also commander of the Red Army, and with them, the school teacher from Glasgow, John McLean, already jailed twice for preaching revolution. Leon Trotsky kept a watch on the political situation in Scotland and Ireland. And after the execution of James Connolly, Trotsky wrote of the failed Irish nationalist rebellion. Under an archaic banner, it has carried its class indignation against militarism and imperialism. Scottish soldiers smashed the Dublin barricades, but in Scotland itself, miners are rallying round the red banner raised by John Maclean and his comrades. Maclean's lectures on Marxist theory attracted the biggest economics class in Europe. His pupils were Clydeside workers numbered in thousands, and inevitably, their politics spilled into the streets. In 1919, a huge workers' demonstration broke up in violence. Some of the workers' leaders were battened down. Willie Gallagher, a follower of Maclean, was arrested for attacking the chief constable. Another jailed was Manny Shinwell, later to become Minister of War in the Labour government. But in 1919, the authorities' fear was that Glasgow might become another Petrograd. The following year, Lenin called communists from all over the world to Moscow. Lenin publicly attacked the Scottish delegate Gallagher and his mentor Maclean for being too left-wing. And he then persuaded Gallagher that he and his comrades should unite in a Marxist party and go on to work through the Labour movement and through Parliament. McDermott himself, 
went on to become a socialist councillor in the town of Montrose. In 1922, the independent Labour Party to which he belonged swept the polls in Scotland and sent 20 MPs to Westminster, led by the Red Clydesiders. By now, the uncompromising Maclean was more and more isolated, holding out still for revolution and an independent Scottish Republic. But two and a half years in prison had broken his health. John Maclean died at the age of 44 in 1923. 15,000 workers followed his coffin. The role of Maclean in the history of the Scottish working class is now almost forgotten but McDermott has fought to keep alive his memory. McDermott's other hero died within six weeks of Maclean. You might talk to a woman who had been a young girl in 1917 and find that the name of Stalin lit no fires, but when you asked her if she'd seen Lenin, her eyes lighted up and her reply was the Russian word which means both beautiful and red. Lenin, she said, was Krasivy Krasivy. John Maclean too was Krasivy Krasivy a description no other Scot has ever deserved. Three years later, when the general strike was called in 1926, Christopher Murray Grieve was 34, married with a young daughter and working as a journalist in Montrose. But he was also a poet with a growing reputation. He had taken the pen name of Hugh McDermott and was expressing much of his poetry and politics in Scots. A rose lauked out and grew until it was ten times the size or only rose the thistle of four had heisted to the skies. Scottish trade unionists came out solidly. To McDermott it seemed that radical change was again possible through the general strike. And still it grew till all the bush was hidden in its flame. I never saw as a bra flour as yon thronstock became. And still it grew until it seemed the hale braid earth had turned, a reed reed rose that in the lift, like a ball of fire burned. The militants wanted a strike to bring down the government. But on the tenth day, the General Council in London ordered a return to work. McDermott was dismayed. Sign the rose shriveled suddenly as a balloon is burst. The thistle was a ghastly stick as Guinness had been cursed. Was it the ancient vicious sway imposed its cell again, or nerve our week for a new emprise that made the effort vain? When the news came that the general strike was called off, I was addressing a meeting of real women in Montrose. When I told them of the great betrayal, many of them burst into tears. And I'm not ashamed to say I did too. A coward strain in that long growth that rocked the sorry trick a thistle like a rocket sword and come down like the stick. The epic poem from which these verses came established McDermott's reputation. It was written in a language he recreated from the old Scots tongue. I set out to prove that Scots could be a language of ideas, not just emotions, and that its words could convey subtleties impossible in English. In this poem, called A Drunk Man Looks at the Thistle, McDermott wonders on the fate of Scotland. Nearly 3,000 lines long, this poem had said a critic, the same effect on Scotland as a childbirth in a church. Our people still use the Scots tongue. My poetry was about a Scotland which allowed itself to be robbed of its past. A fashionable phrase then was, don't let us be prisoners of our own history. As well as leading the fight for a Scottish literary revival, Hugh McDermott, the politician, was also trying to change Scotland's political destiny. In 1928, he helped found the National Party of Scotland and told the inaugural rally. I have been for 20 years an active socialist worker, but I am of the opinion that the position and prospects of Scotland are so deplorable that it behoves all true Scots of whatever party to sink their other differences in the interests of a great national movement of reconstruction. Over the past 
few years, British steels had to get into shape to compete in one of the world's toughest markets. It hasn't always been easy, but the results have been dramatic. We've made ourselves leaner and tougher and more flexible. Output is up, UK sales are up, exports are up, profits are up. The Keep Fit program of British Steel. you a lot. Calcium, protein, vitamins. Clearly a better choice. Go for Belmore quality when you're fitting windows. If you're buying a house or flat for the first time, it pays to look around for the best mortgage deal. Because usually you need most of your savings for your deposit. And then there's legal fees, surveys, decoration, carpets, curtains, tables, chairs, hi-fi, cooker, TV, video, bed, bedding, country, crockery, furniture. <coughs> Bank of Scotland knows it's a nightmare, which is why we offer 100% mortgages with free extras, including house buildings insurance, leaving your money for the other things you've got your eye on. For your copy of our first-time buyer's guide, call in at any branch. For written details, dial 100 and ask for free phone Bank of Scotland. We're 100% behind first-time buyers. Bank of Scotland, a friend for life. of tartan special if i'm not mistaken can you believe it terrible careful how you talk about tartan special around here no that thing out there well the beastie of the moor i can't tell us such a creature but personally i'm not swallowing that one. And don't darken my door again. Everything all right, lads? Tartan, the original special. Anything else just doesn't make sense. Hugh McDermott's political speeches and his often abusive attacks in print had provoked and antagonised almost every section of Scottish opinion. In 1929, at the age of 37, he left Scotland for London. The plan was to start a magazine about radio with a fellow Scottish nationalist, the novelist Compton Mackenzie, who judged McDermott to be... ..the most powerful intellectually and emotionally fertilising force Scotland has known since the death of Burns. At this time, those who had influenced the Scottish poet, philosophers, writers and friends, often saw the great artist in the role of political visionary. And half a century later, their ideas are far removed from any left-wing orthodoxy. Like W.B. Yeats, the great Irish poet, a nationalist sympathetic to Mussolini and Franco, Yeats was also a mystic who believed, the best bred from the best shall claim again their ancient omens. The poet T.S. Eliot, an Anglican and conservative, who published McDermott's poems and later said of him, Hugh McDermott's refusal to become merely another successful English poet has had important consequences and has justified itself. George Bernard Shaw, the Irish writer with a contempt for democracy which McDermott was to share. They helped found Penn International, a union of poets and writers. Shaw admired the men of destiny, dictators like Stalin and Mussolini. Back in 1923, after Mussolini took power, McDermott saw his Italian fascism as a cleansing force and offered his own programme for an experiment in patriotic socialism entitled Plea for a Scottish Fascism. Most influential of all fellow poets was Ezra Pound, an American who chose to live in fascist Italy. Interned after the war for his broadcasts in support of fascism, Pound died admitting the tragedy of his life had been his provincial anti-Semitism. 
Another early influence was Carl Jung, the Swiss psychologist whose theories were criticized for offering comfort to Nazi ideology. Jung recognized earlier than most the terrifying appeal of fascism to the darker forces neglected by the rationalist left. And McDermott also believed that great poetry was about a mad leap into the symbol. And he felt too he understood the appeal of Hitler. In 1931, McDermott wrote, Scottish nationalists ought to consider carefully the principle which Hitler and his national socialists in Germany opposed to Marxism. Hitler's Nazis wear their socialism with precisely the difference which post-socialist Scottish nationalists must adopt. Class consciousness is anathema to him, and in contradistinction to it, they set up the principle of race consciousness. McDermott's magazine failed in London, and his marriage had also broken up, hurting him badly. He returned to Scotland. It's the voice of the sooth that's held our lang, my Viking north we had sighed and sang. In 1933, he sailed as far north as he could go, to the Shetlands, the island of Wolsey. The Shetland archipelago is the bleakest and most northerly part of Britain. I'll hae nae halfway hoose, but I be war extremes meet. It's the only way I can to dodge the curse conceit of being recht that damns the vast majority of men. The house in Wolsey was in a fisherman's row, with two bare rooms and a loft above for nets. With him into exile and poverty went McDermott's second wife, a Cornish girl and fellow Celtic nationalist, Valda Trevlin, and their baby son, Michael. And in another reversal, the advocate of the revival of old Scots was now more and more writing in English. The culture of the Shetland Islands is more Norse than Celtic, but McDermott was now obsessed by the obscure source of the ancient Gallic culture of Scotland and think of the oriental providence of the Scottish Gael, the eastern affiliations of his poetry and his music, the subtler music, the clear light where time burns back about the eternal embers. McDermott evolved his own strange theory of Celtic culture, a myth of a past and a race psychology which he claimed sprang from the depth of the east quite alien to the down-to-earth English. For him, a key to the mystery of the source was the great music of the Scottish Gaels, the Peabroch. Not to one country or race, but to humanity. Not to this age, but to all time, as your Peabrochs that are like the glimpses of reality transcending all reason. He also demanded that Scotland take seriously its Gaelic poetry, an art form largely neglected since the breaking of the Highland clans. McDermott believed this old tribal culture was one in which bards and musicians were celebrated and the genius of great pipers like the McCrimmons was held in more awe than the power of a chief. Only one occasion would I have loved to witness, after Imbaruri, when Lord Louis Gordon's pipers kept silence since Duncan Ban McCrimmon was his prisoner. No Scottish army or English, no army in the world would do that today nor ever again for they do not know, and there is no means of telling them, that kings and generals are only shadows of time, but time has no dominion over genius. McDermott now lived the role of great poet as prophet, fighting to save genius from the stupidity of the masses. To hell we happiness, I sing the terrifying discipline of the free mind that guards a man, mack his joys, kill his joys. Your song, O oh God, that none dare hear save the insane and such as I apostate from humanity. Here a man must shed the encumbrances that muffle contact with elemental things, the subtleties that seem inseparable from a humane life, and go apart into a simple and sterner, more beautiful and more oppressive world, austerely intoxicating. The first draft is overpowering. 
you survive it. In 1935, the poet had a physical and mental breakdown. He was seven weeks in hospital. A public testimonial to McDermott was signed by almost every working writer and hundreds of other notables in Scotland. The place you have won as a poet is that of creative pioneer, enlarging human and Scottish consciousness and bringing your own country into vital touch with the main currents of world thought. Much of the poetry written in exile in Wolsey was as bleak, hard, and inaccessible as the island itself. Stones blacker than any in the Kaaba, cream-colored cornstone, Chateau pieces, Celadon and Corbo, Bista and Beige, Glaucus, Hoare and Fulded Syathaform, making mere faculae of the sun and moon, I study you, glout and gloss. I must begin with these stones as the world began. We must be humble. We are so easily baffled by appearances and do not realize that these stones are one with the stars. It makes no difference to them whether they are high or low, mountain peak or ocean floor, palace or pigsty. There are plenty of ruined buildings in the world, but no ruined stones. This is no heap of broken images. Let men find the faith that builds mountains, which they will no more see than they saw the rise. What happens to us is irrelevant to the world's geology, but what happens to the world's geology is not irrelevant to us. We must reconcile ourselves to the stones, not the stones to us. The political McDermott was still as reckless as ever. In the mid-30s, the Scottish Nationalist Party he helped found expelled him as an extreme leftist. The Scotsman newspaper denounced him as one of the most extreme and unbalanced men in Scotland. I am 46 of tenacious, long-lived country folk. Fools regret my poetic change from my enchanting early lyrics, but I have found in Marxism all that I need. This is the poetry I want, all I can now regard as poetry at all, as poetry of the day, not of the past, a communist poetry. Red granite and black diorite, with the blue of the Labradorite crystals gleaming like precious stones, in the light reflected from the snow, and behind them, the eternal lightning of Lenin's bones. Some of McDermott's best-known poetry is addressed to the dead Lenin, one of the few with whom he will converse as an equal. Unremitting, relentless, organized to the last degree. The Lenin who seemed to share his own peculiar hunger to know and understand everything when he wrote. Communism becomes an empty phrase and a communist a mere bluffer if he has not worked over in his consciousness the whole inheritance of human knowledge. We are living in such a grave, such a dark, such a dangerous epoch, and the artist who is not willing to participate in his course as a leader of men seems to me to be feelingless and senseless. McDermott was himself now in no doubt which side he was on. I have returned to Earth, to Spain. I have come back to myself. They were the people of destiny, of destiny, not fate. Destiny went tied to their saddlebow, linked with them in some mysterious fashion. I do not know why. In the presence of the fact, there is nothing to do but bow the head. McDermott had worked with Keir Hardy, the founder of the Labour Party, in the early years when it had been strong in support of Scottish Home Rule. But over 30 years, the Scots socialist tradition had hardened John McLean, the school teacher with his economics and Marxist theory, had toughened the movement. Scots workers later supplied much of the brain and muscle of the British Communist Party, and McDermott argued in the party for the McLean line, a red Republican Scotland. Willie Gallagher, the engineer who had been instructed by Lenin to work through Parliament, opposed him. A former follower of McLean, he was now in the 30s, the only communist in Parliament. Another old comrade of the poet was Jimmy Maxton, who also kept alive the Scots' reputation for militancy in Westminster. But in the 30s, politics was swinging to the right, both in Britain and Europe. In the Spanish Civil War, Scots
Scots were strong in the International Brigade and Peter Kerrigan, another Clydeset engineer, was one of the last commanders of the British battalion. By advocating separate battalions to keep the Scots apart from the English, McDermott claims he brought down on himself the wrath of the communist leadership. He was expelled. So the poet who had helped found the Scottish National Party only to be expelled for his communism was now expelled from the British Communist Party for his nationalism. I must be a Bolshevik before the revolution, but I'll cease to be one quick when communism comes to rule the roost. For real literature can exist only where it's produced by madmen, hermits, heretics, dreamers, rebels, skeptics, and such a door of utterance has been given to me as none may close whosoever they be. The Second World War ended McDermott's exile in Shetland. He came to Glasgow as an engineer making bands for shells. Conditions were hard and McDermott was injured when a pile of metal fell on him. At the age of 50, he was transferred to an anti-submarine patrol in the Clyde. But the poet was dismayed by the working-class Scotland he'd come back to. It'll be no easy matter to keep the dirt in its place and get the future out alive in this case. Glasgow had for half a century the reputation of being the most depressed, drunken, violent and overcrowded slum. It was called the cancer of the empire. The houses at Glasgow, not the people. These are simply the food the houses live and grow on endlessly drawing from their vulgarity and pettiness and darkness of spirit, gorganizing the mindless generations, turning them all into filthy property. I am horrified by the triviality of life, by its corruption and helplessness. No prospect of eternal life, no fullness of existence, no love without betrayal, no passion without satiety. Yet life could be beautiful even now. What untouched spiritual powers are hidden in the dark and cold under the suffocating atmosphere of Philistine life, waiting for a better time when the first ray of light and breath of fresh air will call them to life and let them unfold. Day. The surrounding world, the life of men, is entangled and meaningless. Society is the endless human triviality. One consolation for McDermott was the flicker of life still left in Scottish nationalism. Christmas Day sensation at Westminster Abbey. The Stone of Destiny, which had been there for some 600 years, was stolen from the coronation chair. You can see how the thieves tore it out, smashing parts of the chair in the process. And the initials JFS, thought to mean justice for Scotland, were carved on it. It was on this sacred symbol that the kings of Scotland had been crowned before the stone was carried off by an invading English army. A padlock door had been forced open, and presumably a car or lorry was waiting outside to take it away. From a representative group of people in Glasgow, we learn how widely Scottish opinion on the subject varies. Well, I'm just a Scotsman, and I, when I heard the news, I nearly killed myself laughing. That same year, 1950, a million and a quarter Scots signed a national covenant which read, We solemnly enter into this covenant whereby we pledge ourselves in all loyalty to the Crown and within the framework of the United Kingdom to do everything in our power to secure for Scotland a Parliament. This request was altogether too polite for McDermott. In 1950, he stood for election as an independent nationalist. But if the poet was an elitist, the people didn't think much of him either. The Tories won with 15,000 votes, Labour polled nearly 14,000, Hugh McDermott got 639. Two years later, McDermott's son Michael refused to serve in a British army. The family appealed to Manny Shinwo, a conscientious objector himself in the early days. But Shinwo refused to help. McDermott's wife Valda threw eggs at him. Michael Grieve was jailed for six months. 
Meanwhile, the Stone of Destiny reappeared mysteriously in the ruins of Arbroath Abbey. Here, in 1320, just six years after the victory at Bannockburn, the nobles of Scotland sent to the Pope a declaration which Scots nationalists still invoke today. As long as but a hundred of us remain alive, never will we, on any conditions, be brought under English rule. It is, in truth, not for glory, nor riches, nor honours that we are fighting, but for freedom. Coronation year saw some abortive attempts to blow up pillar boxes. Their offence, the insignia E2R. There had been a Queen Elizabeth I of England, but never, the Nationalists pointed out, an Elizabeth I of Scotland. However, when Elizabeth was crowned on the reclaimed Stone of Destiny, this Republican resentment was lost in the enthusiasm for the young Queen. Once again, McDermott unleashed his contempt on his fellow Scots. <laughs> in this huge, ineducable, heterogeneous hotch and rabble, why am I condemned to squabble? A Scottish poet mon assume the burden o' his people's doom and dee to brack their living tomb. The emptiness of their lives is quite incredible. They certainly have no intellectual interests of any kind and except on the merest trivia it was impossible to have any sort of conversation with them. Their unexamined lives do not seem to me worth having. Scottish with their bra shirt fronts and all their fancy friends rejoicing. Rabbi, wouldst thou wert here, the world hath need and Scotland mercy o' the likes of thee. The whisky that ain't smooth your liars become a laxative for all aquacity. As langs my ear. No one in fifty kens a word Burns wrote, but misapplied is Obadi's property, and Ginner was as like alive the day. They'd be the last of Ken and Hon to gee. In 1956, the Soviet Union invaded Hungary and put down a popular revolt against the communist regime. In Britain, thousands of members resigned in disgust from the Communist Party. One rejoined, Hugh McDermott, then as now, a Stalinist. What matters what we kill to lessen that foulest murder that deprives most men of real lives? Now 64, he explained that when an old friend was in trouble, you did not turn your back. I fight in red for the same reasons that Garibaldi chose the red shirt. A man in a red shirt can neither hide nor retreat. The paradoxes and extreme politics of McDermott outraged his critics and often dismayed his friends. McDermott explained it away with ironic pedantry as the Caledonian anti-Syzygy, a capacity to entertain at the same time two or more opposite and irreconcilable opinions. While indulging this so-called Scottish capacity for contrasts, McDermott did at least share with his fellow Scots a taste for ritual hard drinking. 
The majority of Glasgow pubs are for connoisseurs of the morose, for those who relish the element of degradation in all boozing. True Scots always prefer storm to sunshine, sour to soup. That is one of our principal differences from the English. We do not like the confiding, the intimate, the ingratiating, the hail fellow well met, but prefer the unapproachable, the hard-bitten, the recalcitrant, the sinister, the malignant, the sarcastic, the saturnine, the cross-grained and the cankered. We have no damn fellow feeling at all, and look at ourselves and others with an eye of a Toulouse Lautrec appraising an obscene old Torag doing a double split. In short, we are all poets, all true Scots that is, all Scots not encased in a carapace of conventionality a mile thick. And as William Blake said, all poets are of the devil's party. Even at 70, the devil was still in McDermott. Let's make a better joke in politics and art than the English yet, and damn consistency. Swiss Chief Inspector Runcy and Hansen has career. I'm Hansen up and in my road like McDermott took his protest against the H-bomb to Trafalgar Square and shared a platform with Bertrand Russell, advocating direct action against the government. Then in 1964, the poets stood against the new Prime Minister, a fellow bodderer, Sir Alex Douglas Hume. The Tories in Scotland were astonished when he was suddenly exhumed and put into <laughs> and put into this particular position. He's the apotheosis of mediocrity. A complete nullity. We all have our personal problems, and there are local problems too. Again, but not many Scots were of the devil's party. Sir Alex, the Conservative Scot from Eton and Oxford, got 16,659 votes. McDermott, the Communist Nationalist, got 127. Winifred Margaret Ewing has been duly elected... But in Scotland, the Nationalist spirit McDermott had fought to keep alive suddenly burst back into life. The Scots Nationalist unexpectedly won a by-election, then in the general election of 1970, went on to poll 300,000 votes. But McDermott stayed with the communists. Gallagher, the old communist leader from the days of Red Clydeside, was dead. One of his last requests was for McDermott's collected poems. But although Scottish communists could make no impression at the polls, in the mines, factories and shipyards, there was still a force. Those, and there are those in society that try to diminish our self-confidence as workers that try to inculcate in ourselves a self-belittlement of our own ability and our own intelligence. When the workers occupied the Clyde shipyards to stop their closure, industrial Scotland marched in support. And when the miners struck against the Conservative government in 1973, Scots militants were again in the vanguard. ...upon our members for a massive vote of yes for strike action in order to establish wages. The miners' strike provoked a general election and the defeat of the Conservative government. One consequence was that the Scottish Nationalists' vote doubled again in February 1974, giving them seven members of Parliament. In the next election, a few months later, the Nationalists won 11 seats and took a full third of all Scottish votes. The ironies mount for McDermott. One source of the new self-confidence in Scotland was the oil flowing in from around the once impoverished Shetlands. The revival of Scottish nationalism is one reason for the increased interest in McDermott's poetry, now a vast, uneven opus piled up over 60 years. But after a long and hard life in the country which obsesses him, he at least has the consolation that his stature as a major poet of the 20th century is now recognized abroad. 
But in Scotland, his fierce contempt for local worthies can still give offence. On his 78th birthday, his hometown of Langham turned down a proposal to make McDermott a freeman and gave the honour instead to another with a border name. Zero. All engine running. Liftoff. We have a liftoff. Neil Armstrong reporting the roll and pitch program. Mars is bra and cramacy. Venus in a green silk goon. The old moon shacks are gowden feathers. Their starry talks are queen of blethers. Name for thee a thought despairing. Earth thou bonny brooked bairn. But greet and in your tears yell droon. The hail clan Jamfrey. Today, at 85, Christopher Murray Grieve lives quietly with his wife Valda in a two-room cottage in the Lanarkshire Hills. But Hugh McDermott, the reckless warrior poet, still provokes and abuses the political establishment. Even those who have led the great revival of Scottish nationalism are denounced as no better than a tartan bourgeoisie. But despite it all, when the University of Edinburgh gave him an honorary doctorate, they offered this assessment of his work. Every man will choose from his work what he likes. And there's a body of poems that no man can decry and that Scotland will keep for its inheritance. Oh, Scotland is the barren fig, up carols up and ruin it jig. Old Moses took a dry stick and instantly it flowered in his hand. Pull Scotland up and walk and say it win a bud and blossom tea. A miracle's your only chance, up carols up and let us dance. The rose of all the world is not for me. I want, for my part, only the little white rose of Scotland that smells sharp and sweet and breaks the heart. 